Thank you. Thank you. Spider has freed us. Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. <laughs> Okay, so day two of Joe Biden healing the world and healing the nation and the world and healing. He says, when I'm speaking to foreign leaders, I'm telling them America is going to be back. We're going to be back in the game. America's back, baby. U.S. military convoy enters northeast Syria, January 21st. Inauguration day. They're back in. U.S. military convoy enters the northeast. Empire's got to operate through COVID, baby. We can't get a vaccine distributed, but we can still set the world on fire. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. A large U.S. military convoy entered northeastern Syria on Thursday. Syrian state news reports citing sources on the ground. There you go. According to the report, the convoy included 40 trucks and armored vehicles and was backed from the air by helicopters. And it entered Syria from Iraq via the Al Walid crossing to bring arms and logistical equipment to the bases. At the same time, reports that some 200 U.S. troops arrived in the Hasaka province on helicopters. Iraq, Syria, it's like a reunion tour of countries we bombed. It's nice. <laughs> According to the report, the troops are set to deploy on the nearby oil fields with Kurdish-controlled eastern Syria rich in energy resources. They're sending the troops right to the oil fields. In late 2020, then U.S. President Donald Trump ordered U.S. troops withdrawn from that area to redeploy in Iraq. They're being deployed directly onto oil fields, an airy way of reminding people exactly why they're there. By the way, one third of Biden's Pentagon transition team hails from organizations financed by the weapons industry. In 2017, Blinken, that's his new secretary of state, praised the Trump administration for bombing Syrian airfields. So, so Joe Biden's new secretary of state praised Donald Trump when? When he bombed Syrian airfields and called for a move toward negotiation of trans transition of power, a goal which he admitted eluded the Obama administration. Blinken served as deputy national security advisor and deputy secretary of state in the Obama administration. His support for the invasion of Iraq and the assault on... He, has, he supported the Iraq and Libya. That's awesome. He also supported more aggressive military measures against Syria. Does he regret any of this? President Biden is warning Iran to, quote, be careful if it continues to support militia groups that threaten U.S. interests or personnel. The warning follows U.S. airstrikes in Syria Thursday that took out facilities used by Iranian-backed militia groups to attack U.S. and allied forces in Iraq. Syria condemned the airstrikes. Iran has not responded. David Martin reports. Cell phone video shows what was left of a desolate outpost on the Syrian side of the border with Iraq. Two F-15 Eagles dropped seven 500-pound bombs, completely destroying nine buildings and damaging two. Initial reports said one person was killed and three injured. We recognize the significance of this operation as the first of its kind under the new administration. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said Iranian-backed militias used the border post to smuggle weapons into Iraq. The Biden administration just bombed Syria. Iranian-backed militias in Syria is how it's being reported. Um, and at the same time, we learned that the Senate parliamentarian declared, oh, you can't put the $15 minimum wage in the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. Biden and Kamala, all of the evidence at this point in time right now, is pointing to the conclusion that they will accept the result of the Senate parliamentarian. That is unacceptable. Just so you understand, it's an advisory opinion. They don't have to listen to it. If they do listen to it, they are choosing to listen to it because they don't actually want a $15 minimum wage. They could easily just say, we disagree and we're gonna put it in there. And then they could put it in there and then they can get it passed. But that would require wanting it and then having balls and trying to fight for it by getting, you know, Manchin and Cinema and whoever else needs to fall in line to fall in line. Now, Biden has the political capital to do that right now. He has a 62% approval rating. He's phenomenally popular. He's in his honeymoon phase as president. So without a doubt, he could raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. The has exposed, as I've mentioned, so many weaknesses in the healthcare system. Um, the most vulnerable, often black and brown communities, uh, have been handling much of the financial burden. Before the pandemic, you were against comprehensive single-payer system. Um, now, if, Med if Medicare for All came across your desk as the pandemic um, has hit so hard, would you veto it? It's not going to come across my desk, but the, the, look, the pandemic has not only 
torn through our nation, devastating families and wrecking economies. It's exacerbated some of the worst inequities. I'm going to fight for health and health equities, but you don't need the quickest way to get that is for black and Latino Americans to have access to the Obamacare with a public option. That's the quickest way we can get everybody covered. But hasn't this pandemic and the tsunami of layoffs shown the limits of private health care um, that is tied to employment? No, it hasn't, in my view. There's countries that have, in fact, uh, si- single payer systems that hadn't helped them very much either. The question is, what do we do about rallying the pandemic and treating those who are affected by it? Everyone who's affected by the pandemic is access to free care for anything having to do with that pandemic. Let's flash forward. Your president, Bernie Sanders, is still active in the Senate. He manages to get Medicare for all through the Senate in some compromised version, the Elizabeth Warren version or or other version. Nancy Pelosi gets a version of it through the House of Representatives. It comes to your desk. Do you veto it? I would veto anything that delays providing the security and the certainty of health care being available now. If they got that through and by some miracle, and there was an epiphany that occurred, and some miracle occurred that said, okay, it's passed, then you got to look at the cost. I want to know, how did they find the $35 trillion? What is that doing? Is it going to significantly raise taxes on the middle class, which it will? What's going to happen? Uh, look, my opposition isn't to the principle that there should be, you should have Medicare. I mean, I, everybody, mm-hmm. health care should be a right in America. My opposition relates to whether or not, A, it's doable, to what the cost is and what the consequences for the rest of the budget are. How are you going to find $35 trillion over the next 10 years without having profound impacts on everything from taxes for middle class and working class people, as well as, as well as the impact on the rest of the budget? administration separated children from their parents at the border, at least 4,000 kids. You've since reversed your zero tolerance policy, but the United States can't locate the parents of more than 500 children. So how will these families ever be reunited? Our children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people, cartels, and they're brought here and they used to use them to get into our country. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. You see the numbers and we let people in, but they have to come in legally and they come in through. But America. how will you reunite these kids you, with their families, let me just tell you, Mr. President? They built cages. You know, they used to say, I built the cages. And then they had a picture in a certain newspaper. And it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, look at these cages. President Trump built them. And then it was determined they were built in 2014. That was him. Do you they have a plan cages. to reunite the kids? Yes, we're working family? on it very, we're, we're trying very hard. But a lot of these kids come out without the parents. They come over through cartels and through coyotes and through gangs. Vice President Biden, let me bring you into this conversation. Quick response and then another question to you. These 500 plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. 
Bay, real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot, it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Kristen, they did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not They built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, about. Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. President Biden, to you, North Korea conducted four nuclear tests under the Obama administration. Why do you think you would be able to rein in this persistent threat? Because I'd make it clear, which we were making clear to China, they had to be part of the deal. Because here's the re I made it clear and as a spokesperson of the administration when I went to China, that they said, why are you moving your missile defense up so close? Why are you moving more forces here? Why are you continuing to do uh, um, uh, m military maneuvers with South Korea? I said, because North Korea is a problem, and we're going to continue to do it so we can control them. We're going to make sure we can control them and make sure they cannot hurt us. And so if you want to do something about it, step up and help. If not, it's going to continue. What has he done? He's legitimized North Korea. He's talked about his good buddy, who's a thug, a thug, and he talks about how we're better off. And they are, have much more capable missiles, able to reach U.S. territory much more easily than ever did before. You've said you wouldn't meet with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get the, the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear-free zone. All right, let's move on to American families. Kristen, they tried Very to quickly, meet with 10 him. Seconds, President. They tried to meet with him. He okay. wouldn't do it. He didn't like Obama. He didn't like him. He wouldn't do it. Okay, you know, I gotta give fact, him a chance to respond to that he before we move do on. It. And no that's way. okay. You know what, North Korea, we're not in a war. We have a good relationship. You know, people don't understand. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on, other countries is a, a lot good of thing. We have a lot of questions to get yes. to. Not Your response. Like we had a good relationship with Hitler before he, in fact, invaded. So I warned the last time we talked about this issue that uh, you got to read the fine print. With Biden, you always have to read the fine print. I wish that wasn't the case, but it is. There's been a number of executive orders that he signed that the headlines were wonderful, and then you read the details and you're like, this is bullshit. One of them was the private prison one, where the headlines made it seem like he's going to get rid of private prisons. Then the details are, no, 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 I'm only going to get rid of private prisons that were contracted with, was it the Department of Justice? It was the Department of Justice. And there's only like 14,000 prisoners in Department of Justice prisons. And there's over like 100,000, 116,000, I think the number was, in um, private prisons. So he could have banned all U.S. government agencies from contracts with private prisons. He didn't. So, for example, ICE, 67% of their prisons are private prisons. His executive order did not say 
We're also not going to re-up the ICE contracts with private prisons. It was just the Department of Justice. So in other words, it was a virtue signaling move that really the substance is not there. You could say it's a baby step in the right direction, but really, really the point of it was to be misleading, was to get the accolades while not really changing anything. By American executive order. Again, baby step in the right direction, but he didn't go all the way to say, no, products that the U.S. government buys need to be made in America. He just changed the rules a little bit to get a few more of the products that the U.S. government buys made in America. So again, I don't like this fact, but it is what it is. And I got to tell you guys the truth. A lot of these executive orders are Weasley. And, you know, they make it seem like we're going to do an amazing thing. And then it's like, well, not really. You didn't really do it. It was very weak. Well, now we get another example of something similar. Advocates cheered when President Biden announced an end to U.S. support for offensive military operations in Yemen, but questions are now being raised about what will actually change. The Pentagon has said it halted intelligence sharing related to offensive operations, but that it is also reviewing how best to implement the new policy. The Biden administration has also appointed to its suspension has also pointed, excuse me, to its suspension of two precision precision guided bomb sales to Saudi Arabia approved late in the Trump administration. But the administration has also made clear it will continue defending Saudi Arabia from attacks, including after including after one this past week at an airport near the kingdom's border with Yemen that um, that singed a civilian plane. And the Pentagon has previously characterized U.S. military support for Saudi Arabia, including intelligence sharing, as largely defensive. The question at hand now is what the administration will consider offensive support versus defensive. There's the trick. There's the trick. So originally, the headlines were like, we're not going to support Saudi Arabia and the genocide in Yemen anymore. Is it wrong? Those are the original headlines. Now we get some more details. They say, oh, we're still going to help Saudi Arabia, but we're going to make sure it's only, we're only going to help when it's defensive not offensive. I'm supposed to trust you and your judgment on what's defensive and offensive? We're supposed to trust you on that. You're just going to do whatever you guys want to do, and you're going to say it's defensive in nature. I mean, they can make an argument that the whole thing has been defensive. They can say that. It's bullshit, but they can say that. They don't have to prove it. There's no enforcement mechanism here. So, this really, this is bullshit. Like, yet again, man. Yet again. I could go on and on, such as with the fact that Biden rejoining the Paris Climate Accords is a drop in the bucket compared to the real immediate action that needs to be taken to circumvent runaway climate change and ecological catastrophe, or how he is now going to start using LGBT rights as a cynical excuse to sanction countries that are our geopolitical enemies. But instead, I believe I shall leave you all with a quote from a gem that I found within the comments section of one of Uncle Thomas's videos by YouTuber Nathan Wagner. If a politician's number one policy, whether they're on the left or right, isn't to end our murderous colonial empire, then anything they offer you domestically is nothing more than a bribe in exchange for your complacency and with and hence complicity in their war crimes. The trade you make from the perspective of the people whose family or themselves are slaughtered by our neoliberals is you signing off on their deaths in exchange for gay marriage, contraceptive rights, or a Republican health care plan that mainly benefits the insurance companies. Scraps. Scraps in the sense that they are a fraction of the basic human rights we should just have. Scraps that they are never actually come through on in a substantial way. I get the sense that they purposefully leave these small portions of basic human rights open to attack by Republicans so that we are in constant danger of them being taken away. The establishment Democrats hold this threat over our heads so they can manipulate liberals through fear, which allows them to remain in power and get away with selling 95% of their votes, selling out our governments to multinational corporations, large banks, big pharma, oil companies, and the military-industrial complex. No one bothers to blink an eye as they carry out the same murderous expansion of empire because the establishment has mastered the art of divide and conquer. It is a first-world privilege to so passively accept war criminals as leaders. It is a false choice that we have to choose between the lesser of two evils, and it all breaks my heart that we feel like we have the luxury of accepting our war crimes because it's not us or our families being slaughtered. There's no reason that we can't have all of our basic human rights and not kill innocent men, women, and children. So next time the establishment offers us half measures and scraps when it comes to the bare minimum of our basic human rights, i.e. the New Deal, Obamacare, even the Civil Rights Act, to keep us docile as they continue to rob us and kill in our name, 
reject their offers and go take it all, everything. Wrestle every aspect of power from our rulers and oligarchs, who have used their power to solely to gain more power through murder, robbery, and oppression, and view us citizens of the world as nothing more than a resource to be used up at their will and turned back into dust. So much senseless violence being carried out in our name on so many innocent souls in exchange for scraps. Accepting politicians who will continue our war crimes is never an acceptable option. Not only does the establishment divide the citizens against each other, i.e. left, right, rich, poor, white, non-white, but they also divide our time and efforts so that we cannot gather strength in numbers and focus on a common route to all of society's problems. Neoliberals have progressives spread out so thin while attempting to deal with a multitude of our society's flaws, dictating exactly what issues they focus their time on and effort on, and the parameters and direction of the conversation. We have to come to the realization that most issues are simply the bad fruits of a common root cause. As long as we focus on the issues they want us to focus on, and approach the issues the exact way they want us to, then we are just playing our role in their script.